So I'm not 100% uh, sure if this will be surprising to anybody, um, but I feel like as a child, I was kind of a nervous child. Not in a bad way, not like, you know how chihuahuas are always kind of nervous because they just sit there and shake and it looks like the world might end for them at any moment. It wasn't that sort of thing. It was just sort of like people would say, ah, that kid's kind of nervous for some reason. And I, I think most kids typically are anxious and nervous about something. Um, and it wasn't that I was... Uh, extra scared of things per se, uh, I knew, you know, what my fears were and uh, that list of them, and I could explain them even if they sounded weird. I wasn't just worried that things would go, you know, terribly wrong. I just worried that it could go wrong. And that little unknown piece there that I would later learn was called pessimism. For me, the glass wasn't just half empty. I mean, yeah, it was half empty, but that wasn't really the problem. The problem for me was, what if I have someone who's a friend and wants something to drink? I don't have enough for both of us. And that was the bigger problem. And that was where I think the nervousness and the anxiety come into play. It's the question of what if. If anything could happen, then... Well, anything can happen. It's the fear of the unknown. That isn't even exactly a fear, but it's more of this anxiety thing. I could tell you why, as a child, I was afraid of the dark or of aliens or of ghosts or of uh, any list of things. I could explain that to you. I could explain why spiders bothered me until they didn't. I could explain all of that to you, but if you put somebody in a room that's completely dark and they can't see anything and they don't know what's around him or her, that causes them to have anxiety. There could be anything there. There could be a lion. There could be a poisonous snake. There could be a pit trap for all you know, because that's what happens in our brains. And that's definitely what happens in my brain at times, you know? This uh, analytical sort of overthinking things where we try to reason out every possible scenario, every possible solution that we can have because our fight or flight response kicks in. Now, it's easy to fight against something when you know what you're fighting against. It's easy to fight against spiders or aliens or any sort of thing like that. But when you don't know where the threat is coming from or what the threat could be, then you have one option, which is flight. It's the anxiety that we find in our gospel text this morning. Jesus telling them that he is going to leave. And he doesn't want to leave them in a lurch because Jesus understands and knows exactly how people are. Jesus understands how we operate because Jesus is human, and so he knows what they're worried about. And, and people have that sort of sense of, I know something's wrong, and I want to help with that. So let me kind of preemptively tell you all of these things. And he starts by telling them, you know, it's, it's very simple. You love me. You love the Father. That's great. That's wonderful. You keep your word. Uh, keep my word. And everything is going to be fine. You know, you, you follow what I have taught you. And it, it's going to be fine. And over and over again, that's kind of the message that he's giving you. Relax. Don't panic. Calm down. This is fine. Everything is going to be fine. Until he starts saying things like, I've said these things to you while I am with you. And it's then the disciples start to realize, oh, he's leaving. He's not going to be here. And so then that causes them the anxiety and the nervousness. And I can't fault the disciples here. Again, I'm still to this day a rather nervous person. I've just gotten over it in some ways. I try too to plan out things as much as I possibly can. There's just differences and there's a caveat with that. 
And so the disciples are likely sitting there thinking, okay, Jesus isn't going to be here. Uh, this is good stuff. Like the word of God, the word of Jesus Christ, this is all wonderful. It's literally the gospel, the good news. And good news demands to be shared, right? So they understand the need to want to share this. The question is how? You see, when Jesus was around, Jesus was the de facto leader. He was in charge. And now he's saying things like, I've said these things uh, while I am with you. And he is telling them, I am going away and I am coming to you. So who does what then? I can guarantee you, if it's anything like any church meeting that I've seen, ain't nobody raising their hands to volunteer unless there's like a half hour of awkward silence. And they're sitting there thinking, okay, Jesus isn't going to be here, but this is important stuff. This is good stuff. So who's going to be in charge now? Well, Peter could do it. After all, he got the nickname Rocky. But should Peter be the one to do that? He's a little flaky at times. Well, maybe Matthew. Matthew could step up and do something. He'd be really good to talk to uh, the Jewish leaders uh, and, and the Gentiles because he was a tax collector. Wait, he can't do it because he was a tax collector. And we won't even get to Simon the Zealot. And he kind of yells a lot because he's a zealot and that's cool for him but we're trying to share this message without scaring people to death and so the disciples ask the question that terrifies us the most what if what if this happens what if that happens and you can only what if for so long until you what if yourself into a pit of anxiousness worry and despair And Jesus knows that this is what they're doing. How could they not? The disciples have devoted their very lives, given up everything that they are, will become enemies of the state because of Jesus. Of course they're scared. Of course they're nervous. And it is then that Jesus tells them the best news yet. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give it to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not let them be afraid. There is a reason why when uh, angelic beings show up in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, where, uh, you know, you have a lot of really weird-looking angels, a lot of times the first thing that the angel will say is what? Do not be afraid. Peace. Peace. Relax. Calm down. It's fine. Yes, things are weird. Things are different right now, but it's fine. There's a reason that why post-resurrection Jesus, one of the first things he says to people when he sees them, knowing that he's a dead man risen to new life, and that's kind of sort of weird, and it might rub people the wrong way, there's a reason why he constantly walks up to people and says, peace, Relax, calm down, this is okay. And it's the peace that, as we find out later in the New Testament, kind of passes all understanding. The world gives you peace at times, too. It doesn't last. Anyone who has been a fan of any professional sport knows that it doesn't last. Anyone who has ever dealt with, you know, having a nice, relaxing drive, and then suddenly, boom, you get rear-ended at a stoplight when you did nothing wrong, and then the person drives off, uh, you know, that's, that doesn't make you very peaceful. It fills you with that anxiety, like, what the heck just happened here? Did I do something wrong? Like, what am I going to do now? What if the car is in danger? What if things are broken? What if, what if, what if? Even though things were fine like five minutes ago, and now you're just a ball of anxiousness and nervousness because that, friends, is the human condition. I have heard humanity described as large, hairless apes who are just constantly anxious. And to an extent, it's true because we overthink things, because we understand things. Knowledge and logic are both a blessing and a curse at times. Because we know that anything could happen, and our mind races, that could happen, this could happen, that could happen, I could have a flat tire on my way to work, I could have uh, an accident, 
I could be abducted by aliens. Uh, the, the Lord could come back at any moment, and I'll never get to finish the Game of Thrones books. You know, anything could happen that derails the plans that we have. And we might have these moments of peace, and the world will tell you, it's okay, relax, calm down. But do you, though? Do you really calm down? I would say, yeah, probably not. And it's nice to have worldly peace for a little while, right? Where you don't have to worry about things, where you're calm and relaxed, but it doesn't last. And see, that's the difference, and that's what Jesus is talking about. See, the peace that Jesus gives, again, passes all understanding. It makes no logical sense. And yet that is what he is telling the disciples. Now, why do they have this peace? Why should they have this peace? Well, because even though Jesus is leading them, Jesus is going to be with them. He drops some really good theology here. He says, I'm still going to be with you because the advocate, the Holy Spirit, is going to come and, and remind you of everything that I've taught you and give you the words to say. And I am there with you. Now, this is really good theology because, again, how we work our communion theology is that the bread has Jesus in it because the Holy Spirit is in it. And where one member of the Trinity is, all members of the Trinity are. Therefore, logic again, if the Holy Spirit is with somebody, that means that Jesus is with them as well. Because Jesus knows full well that what he is asking them to do will put them on a collision course with death. That's what happens to the disciples. And he tells them that. I mean, not right now, but he knows he's giving them a tall order. And in order for the mission to continue, for the ministry to, of Jesus Christ to continue in the world, he is asking the disciples to do terrifying and frightening things, to step into that unknown, that one thing that causes us the anxiety and the anxiousness more than anything, into the world of what if. There's a phrase that we have in our common vernacular. Rome is burning. Referencing, of course, when Rome caught on fire and uh, allegedly the uh, Caesar at the time uh, fiddled. Nero fiddled while Rome was burning. While everyone else was freaking out and panicking and running around and doing what it is that people do in disaster movies, you know. You know running around screaming, this is it, it's the end of the world, game over, man. Just the abject panic and terror because the world around you is falling apart. That's where the disciples are heading. That's the world that the disciples are going to be in. And the worries, the reason they're going to be in that world is because they're doing one of two terrifying M words in the church. Ministry. Scary. And, you know, I have found in my adult life when I meet somebody new or I'm catching up with old friends from high school, uh, for some reason, they don't ever want to ask me about my job. Can't figure that one out. I'm expected to hear about, you know, everything else, but you don't want to ask how my job is. And, and the reason is because they know. And it's, it's a very interesting thing. It's like they think that I'm going to wind up giving a sermon right then and there. I could, but I don't. Everybody should always be ready with some sort of sermon to give. Not that you have to give it at any time, but that's what doing ministry is. Okay, it's word and deed, and it's terrifying. I have seen people uh, give sermons before or talks in church that literally go like this: "Peace be with you," and then they're done like that, just over and done. I've seen people do like the drinking duck thing, where they read and bob and read and bob because they don't want to get a word wrong. 
Talking in front of people in general is a scary thing to do. I've seen my parents cringe with fear when they had to go before the PTA or soccer boards and have to talk in front of people. And we are expected to do that, like a lot. See, it's not just the, the deed part, it's the word part as well. And it's scary. It's hard to put yourself out there. It's hard to emotionally make yourself available because emotional damage is still damage. And nobody wants to get hurt. And that could happen, right? What if I tell somebody something they don't want to hear? Well, then they're going to get mad at me, and then they're not going to like me, and they're going to do this, and they're going to do that, and then before you know it, I'm going to wind up strung up on a tree somewhere. Chased out of town with pitchforks and torches. Hairless apes riddled with anxiety indeed. And that kind of brings us in a weird way to Paul. You see, Paul kind of understood what Jesus was saying, that ministry is not something that's done in a vacuum. It's not a one-person job, but it's the job of the church, the body of Christ. And so what we have here in Acts is this really interesting shift, right? Because the author's there. During the night, Paul had a vision. Okay, wonderful. Uh, we set sail to Troas. Well, who's we? Well, clearly, Luke's the guy who wrote the book, right? So Luke is there. So we're getting this first-hand account because, again, ministry is not a one-person job. It is a job of the church, and what happens is, you know, Paul has this vision. you got to go to Macedonia. All right, cool. They take a long way there because I've never known a disciple to go, like, the most direct route somewhere. And so he goes there and he gets to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. Ooh, he's there, isn't he? In the Gentile world, in the Roman world, in Rome. Well, the Rome is scary. Rome has power. Rome's the one that strung up Jesus on the cross. And so already the people are in this sort of dangerous moment. And as they walk around the city for some days, they get to the Sabbath. And like any good person, they want to worship on the Sabbath. And they go down by the river to pray. And there's a bunch of women there. Now, again, we're already seeing cultural norms start to be questioned. You got a bunch of women and some guys show up. Man, the two aren't really supposed to talk that much. And yet they recognize Paul and they've heard Paul speak before and they want Paul to speak again. And Paul speaks again. And one of the people that is there is a certain woman named Lydia who worshiped God and who deals in purple cloth. From another city, living in Philippi, dealing purple cloth, and those two things are super fascinating and dense. See, first of all, she's a transplant. She knows what it's like to be a stranger in a strange land. Whenever you move somewhere, you have to get used to where you're going. Have you ever been in a situation or a place where you've lived and you've said, oh, down by the creek, and you get looked at weird because it's creek, not creek, unless you're talking about one specific creek that you know where you grew up from? I have. I have confused people by asking for the elusive Jojo, when really, apparently, I should be saying potato wedges. Cultural differences, being a stranger in a strange land, she gets it, she understands it, and so she understands how Paul and Luke are feeling in this moment. The second thing that we read about Lydia is, interestingly enough, she's a dealer in purple cloth. Now, why is that important? Well, first of all, purple is a really snazzy color. It's really beautiful. It's also the color of robe that Jesus had, right? We, we read that Jesus had a purple robe during the crucifixion and everything. And the reason for that is it's a royal color. And the reason that it's a royal color is because it's very hard to produce. It's a hard color to mix and to get right. And so in the ancient world, when somebody had purple cloth, it was a status symbol. 
They didn't have Gucci and Louis Vuitton bags. They had purple clothes. And if you had purple clothes, you were an upper class person. Royalty wore purple because they could get it very easily. And this woman sells it. Now, I'm not saying she was filthy rich, but she was well off. So you have a stranger who's well off, wanting to hear more about God. Now, Paul, being Paul, realizing it's the Sabbath day, could very easily say, it's my day off. I'm good. After all, nobody wants a preacher to preach more than they absolutely have to. Trust me, I know. But no, he gets up there and he starts teaching them and telling them about God, putting himself out there, probably outside of his comfort zone. And this is something that is characteristic of Paul because Paul was the one chosen to bring the message to the Gentile people. And if you don't think that's going to fill somebody with anxiety, (laughs) you're wrong. Paul went from the murderer to the person going to the Gentiles saying, hey guys, Jesus loves you. And then what happens is that Lydia hears all of this, her heart is open, her household is baptized, and she urges them to stay with her. That's the key point. Love is something that demands to be shared. The good news is love in a nutshell. Lydia's open heart shows hospitality because that's what the good news does. It opens doors and hearts to people that they might be transformed, that we too might be transformed as we were transformed and continue along the process of sanctification and being more Christ-like day by day until we are resurrected in perfection where we are like Christ. We aren't Christ, but we are Christ-like, or as we call ourselves, Christian. None of this would happen if it weren't for the sharing of the good news, the sharing of love, the opening of hospitality. It's all connected. All of it is connected. Lydia wouldn't have had her household baptized if Paul wasn't there. Paul wouldn't have been there if he hadn't had the vision. He wouldn't have had the vision if he wasn't called by God to give the message to the Gentiles. Why was he the one chosen to give the message to the Gentiles? Because, as Paul like, refers to himself, he's a very Jewish person. You know, he kept the law, he kept the Torah, did everything he was supposed to, to the point where he persecuted the church. He knew the ins and outs of the faith. And so who else would you send? None of that would have happened if it weren't for, I don't know, the Babylonian exile, the whole stuff with the temple and the Maccabees and all of these things. Everything is so connected and it ultimately goes back to one simple fact, that God loves people. Ministry is scary. It feels like we're doing it on our own sometimes. It feels like it doesn't work, like we can't really make a difference, like we're just putting band-aids on bullet holes. We feel as if we're isolated, but we aren't. We're surrounded by help, not only through the great cloud of witnesses that we work with and labor with, but with the power of Christ himself the power of the Holy Spirit reminding us why it is we do what we do and strengthening us to do what we do. For those people that do ask about what it's like being a minister, oh my gosh, isn't it rough? Like, isn't it hard? You have to get up there and talk to people and you have to go be with people. Like, you know, how does that make you feel? It's rough sometimes, but it's not just rough for me. It's rough for everybody, right? Like that's what we do. We are with people in their vulnerable times. We love them and care for them regardless as to what's going on. And we make ourselves emotionally available and we emotionally attach to people so that they may feel the love that God has because it's all connected. 
It's hard, it's rough, it's scary, I get it. Believe me, I get it. It feels like you were sitting in a room that is on fire. And for some reason, when you think about the power of God, the power of the Holy Spirit, as you sit there in a terrifying situation, knowing that it could be the end, the words that you say are, this is fine. I'm okay with this. Because the peace that passes all understanding is the peace that God gives. I can't control what other people do and how other people react or perceive me or things that I do. That's not something I can do. I can only control myself and the things that I do and the things that I say. And that's hard because it means that I have to be emotionally vulnerable, like everyone has to be emotionally vulnerable. And yet, I have found in the secret of being content in all things, as Paul will go on to say, that when it comes to Jesus and the peace that passes all understanding, it is what it is. Whatever happens, happens. And as long as I am doing my part to spread the word of God, doesn't matter if the house is on fire or not. It matters that God is with me. That's the weird peace that we have with Jesus. I'm calm. I don't freak out and panic because why would I? Anything that happens, happens because that's the way God wants it to happen. I'm not in control and that's okay because I serve the God who is in control. You do too, and that is why you as well are empowered to partake in the reconciling ministry of Jesus Christ in the world. Amen.